Okay, welcome to the last lecture for Unit 6. This is the Art Impulse, um, Art and Power. And in this we're talking about the relationship between art and structures of power, powerful people, whether that's kings or, you know, democratically elected leaders or um, the religious powers, whatever the powers of the world may be, uh, the relationship between the art and the artists. And it's something to keep in mind that um, that that relationship, a lot of the art that we've been looking at, that relationship has always been there, right? And that um, and that going pretty much all the way back to art of ancient Egypt, you really can't separate out art from the um, the very the political powers that needed the art for its political purposes. So we're going to start this lecture. By looking at this we've seen this for a while right the dying lioness and we've had moments to kind of contemplate it we have discussed it in various ways primarily we talked about it as an example of low relief and it's a beautiful work and you probably know from my previous lectures that it's part of a wall freeze at the um, at the palace of Ashurbanipal and um, that this was part of um, an organization so that as you walk towards the king, you would see these two wall friezes on either side. They were probably painted. Um, and, and the two friezes depicted two different topics. One was um, Ashurbanipal at war, and one was Ashurbanipal hunting lions. And they both were, the point of both of these was to represent the idea that Ashurbanipal was a terrifyingly powerful and vicious ruler that no one should try to stand up against and you know that he was worthy of being called king of kings and in fact hunting of lions was considered um, a duty and really a sport only for kings right some an activity that only kings should do and but the thing about this image right here is that many of us when we see it as an image, you know, as projection, uh, reproduction in a, in a book, or if we are lucky enough to see it in person at the British Museum, uh, I've seen it twice, and you, you look at it and you just can't help but feel that this is an image of sympathy. This is an image where an artist made, made an image about someone suffering and that the artist is sympathetic towards the sufferer, right? Not sympathetic towards the powers, not sympathetic towards Ashurbanipal, but sympathetic to the lioness and the struggle she's going through. Now, and to understand this in full context, that when this was part of the wall, she would have been crawling, right? And, you know, she's got arrows, you know, in her, and one of them must have gone through her spine because her back legs are parallel, paralyzed, and she is dragging herself along her legs back legs not working and she was dragging herself towards a male lion who's also close to death you know so you could read this as her trying to you know to get back towards her mate um, as she is paralyzed and as she is dying and it's hard not to see this as an image of sympathy and even to a certain degree as an image of rebellion but i think we have to be suspicious of that right that we as a 20th century or 21st century audience, we are projecting our values onto this image, and that maybe that's not the reason why this image was made the way it was made. Maybe it wasn't that the the captive sculptor who was from some other ethnic group other than Assyrian wanted to felt you know felt a kind of kinship and sympathy with the the lions that were being destroyed. Maybe it's just simply that the the sculptor was trying to make the most powerful and emotionally exciting scene and the making the 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 death and the suffering of the lions and the lioness making it as as palpable as possible was all part of his overall goal of making this an exciting scene and making Ashurbanipal look great and powerful after all if we look at most of that freeze right we the imagery really Lee looks more like this, right? Which is clearly in support of the the powers that be, clearly in support of the idea. I mean, if you if you look at this image, it communicates one thing, which is, you know, I'm so powerful, I kill lions with my bare hands, right? Um, 
And so a lot of the art that we look at is, um, a lot of the art that we have seen is political and it's political in support of the, of, um, the powers that be, of the political forces of that world. But it's important to remember that um, sometimes we may have art that says the opposite, but sometimes we may misread and we may think we see artwork that is an artwork of protest, but it may not be artwork of protest. So here's a good example of that, right? The dying Gauls. How do we interpret the dying Gauls, right? This was um, probably the other great um, architectural work other than the uh, Temple of Zeus, the dying Gauls representing a different victory in battle. Um, in this case, the Pergames um, basically led a coalition of Greek and Hellenistic Greek forces to defeat an invading group of um, of Gaulish people. And after they succeeded in this, the the Pergames city and the, the leaders, they commissioned this um, this piece, which would have been, I think it was like six figures total. Um, and these are Gaulish soldiers and people who are each in different stages of dying, but they're all dying in a way that's very, um, very noble. They're described in ways very kind of like, um, that seem to, once again, to our modern eyes, to be sympathetic to the losers, to be to be admiring of uh, these Gaulish people. And so um, it's hard, I think, for, for us to understand, well, why would the Pergamese celebrate their victory that way? By by essentially what looks to us like celebrating the, their enemies. And I think um, one explanation that may be the right explanation is that to the ancient world, by making these images of how impressive, how heroic these enemies were, how what strong and fierce warriors they were, it makes the Pergamese look even stronger for having defeated such powerful warriors. So anyway, that is, that is our theory. But we do have some art starting even in the ancient world and definitely as we get into the closer to the modern world, we do have examples of art where artists were clearly looking at um, the downtrodden and not just trying to make art that was in support of the, the political powers of their world. So um, I think the old beggar woman is hard to tell, hard to know for certain what the point was and if that point had any kind of social or political meaning, any sense of protest to it. But when we look at something like Henri Daumier's um, lithographs that he made for newspapers and something like this where he's pointing out an, a totally unnecessary tragedy um, I think it and you know and the this you know the horribleness of this tragedy that um, I think it kind of uh, does show that artists sometimes I don't know why I did that sometimes they are um, trying to make statements that are kind of in opposition to the political forces of their world. And here are some other examples. We're getting close to my nine minute mark, but I'll talk a little bit about this one idea and then we're going to pause. So the main point I wanted to make here is that um, it's sometimes just simply, just simply choosing to look at everyday people, especially poor people, willing to use poor people as models is automatically uh, can, can lead to people viewing you as a radical or viewing you as political in opposition to the, to the norms, right? For Courbet, it was a conscious decision to, to choose to represent the, the poorest people, the kind of people who would have been hired to break the rocks for the road, right? Because the painting is about them and then to use them as models. For Caravaggio, it was less a political decision as much as it was maybe an economic decision of what he could afford to hire and, an, and a religious decision, a belief that the people in the, in the Gospels were uh, poorer people. But either way, it still has a political meaning. The fact that these are everyday lower class people says something in, in this painting, and it is something not only religious, but political. Okay, I'm going to end there.